Gentleman, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, witnesses, for being here. Uh, I suppose this is maybe a little bit outside your comfort zone. You didn't find yourself with this kind of attention when you began this endeavor, but uh, I appreciate the courage and the commitment you've made to doing that. We may not agree on a lot of things when it comes to policy and politics, but I think we agree on our concern regarding the topic today. And uh, I'll actually follow on from uh, my Democratic friend and colleague and the things that he has said, because I agree with him. Private companies, I mean, Twitter, Facebook, they can ban whoever they want. They can mute. They can deplatform. They can set up whatever policy they want, and they have the ability to do that. I don't care about that. I agree with that. They should have that authority. The thing that we're concerned about is when the federal government, by proxy, essentially contracts this out. Because the federal government can't ban speech. They can define time and place, but they cannot ban content. And anyone would be foolish to think that when the FBI comes to a private company and highlights speech, and then would expect them to do nothing, of course they would respond to that. The FBI knew they would respond to that. The FBI expected them to respond to that. And I, I could use a couple analogies if I could, and they sound dramatic, but they're exactly right. It's illegal for the United States to assassinate a foreign leader. It would be illegal for the United States to pay $3.2 million to someone to go assassinate a foreign leader. It's illegal in some cases for the United States, or not illegal, but we would have to have a policy debate whether we would invade another country. It would be illegal for the United States to pay a private company like the Wagner Group in Russia to go and fight their battles for them. And that's exactly what the FBI did here. They said, well, we can't do this ourselves. We'll contract it out. We'll launder this effort through another company. And I would just ask you to respond to that. Do you think I'm overly dramatic, or do you think I'm wrong in my characterization of what we see here? I don't. I think you're. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, freedom of speech is the foundation for our democracy, and what we've seen here is federal government putting in extraordinary amounts of pressure, both on Twitter and Facebook. And we haven't talked about Facebook, but we we now know that we have the we have the White House demanding that Facebook take down factual information, and Facebook doing that. And we and with Matt's thread this morning, we saw. Uh, the government contractors demanding the same thing of Twitter. Accurate information, they said, that needed to be taken down uh, in uh, order to advance a narrative. And I have to interrupt just to agree with you. For heaven's sakes, again, we've heard over here, well, they got to take, you know, Fox News lies. There's a reason that 20% of the people trust media. Uh, oh my gosh, if you want to have a conversation about lies and deception in the media, I would love to engage in that because we've seen plenty of it over the last six years, and it's not coming from just Fox News. New York Times, CBS, NBC, every single one of them were saying things that they knew was not true. And they didn't say it once, they said it for years. And the, and the White House, again, trying to stifle things that they know is, is true, but it doesn't fit their narrative. And I gotta give one illustration in the, in the few minute, or minute I have left. When you have an agent, Mr. Chan, who goes to his Twitter and says, please see below list of Twitter accounts which we believe violate your terms of service. I mean, how do you respond to that and defend that? Yeah, FBI should be looking at other private companies' policies and then highlighting, hey, these people might be violating your policies. E either one of you, uh, Mr. Taibbi. If I could, yeah, no, I think there's, thank you, Mr. Congressman, and there's an important point, um, you know, in conjunction with our own research, there's a foundation, the Foundation for Freedom Online, which, um, you know, there's a very telling video that they uncovered where the director of Stanford's um, Election Integrity Partnership talks about how um, CISA, the DHS agency, uh, didn't have the capability to do election monitoring um, and so that they kind of stepped in to fill, quote, fill the gaps legally um, uh, before that capability could be uh, amped up. And what we see in the Twitter files is that Twitter executives did not distinguish 
between DHS or CISA and this group EIP. For instance, we would see a communication that said, um, from CISA escalated by EIP. So they were essentially identical in the eyes of the company. Uh, EIP, uh, in, by its own data, and this is in reference to what, what you brought up, Mr. Congressman, um, according to their own data, they significantly uh, targeted more dis what they call disinformation on the right than on the left um, by a factor, I think, of, uh, of about 10 to 1. Uh, so, and I, and I say that it's not a Republican at all. It's just a fact of what we're looking at. Um, so yes, we, the, we have come to the, to the realization that th this bright line that we imagine that exists between, say, the FBI or the DHS or the GEC and these private companies is, is illusory, and that it, what's more important is this constellation of kind of quasi-private organizations that do this work. Well, and we're over time, so I'll conclude with reemphasizing this. By a factor of 10 to 1, they tried to mute conservative thought. And the federal government cannot contract out suppression of free expression. Yep. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for